So we are changing things up a little bit today, taking a break from our series on the Swedish Rangers, and we're going to do something that, like the last video about the atomic bombs dropped on Japan in World War II, it's a little bit controversial. We're going to do the Tokyo Trial Explained. Um, a lot of people know about the Nuremberg Trials. There's not as much knowledge about the Tokyo Trial. So I'm anxious to get into it. Let's hear what they have to say. Before we jump in, if you like the channel, want to support what we're doing over here, like, comment, subscribe, show YouTube that, you know, you, you like the content. With that being said, let's get into it. The Tokyo Trial saw the end of the Japanese Empire's brutal regime. It helped lay the foundation for international criminal law and the International Court of Justice. And it was only the second time in history an international tribunal sentenced people to prison. The Tokyo Trial saw the end of the Japanese Empire's brutal regime. It helped lay the foundation for international criminal law and the International Court of Justice. And it was only the second time in history an international tribunal sentenced people to prison. And to death. But yet, it's barely mentioned in history. Today, I seek to change that. Japan had been living in a self-imposed isolation for centuries. Until 1854, when the USA forced it to open its ports and markets. Japanese leaders, realizing just how weak they had become compared to the rest of the world, created a plan to rapidly westernize, modernize, and industrialize. As Japan's economy grew, it soon ran out of the resources to run that modern economy. As a result, Japan would fight several wars to gain access to foreign resources, and eventually taking over a large part of Asia, until its defeat at the hands of Allied powers. As the Japanese army moved across Asia, it became apparent that they were committing atrocities on a massive scale. Slave labor, comfort women, massacres. When the tide of war had turned, the leaders of various powers came together to declare that the leaders of Japan will be punished. But the details of this were left vague. When Japan surrendered, the US came to occupy the island nation. And so the question of how Japanese leaders would be punished fell mostly to the USA. And the USA decided to largely copy the system used to punish the German leadership after World War II, called the Nuremberg Trial. It was a military tribunal to prosecute Germany's leaders for war crimes. If you want more information, there's a link at the end of this video. And so the USA established the... Yeah, and we've covered that video, the Nuremberg Trial, on this channel. And one of the things that, it, that I've talked about in that video is... This is all coming from scratch. There is no real groundwork or jurisdiction for an international trial like this. Because, I mean, think about it. What real right does one country have to try in prison, even sentenced to death, the leaders or citizens of another country, another sovereign country? And so you're, you're in a really weird spot here. But basically... Having learned the lessons from World War I and the, the inability of the, the peace treaty and what the Allies did at the end of World War I to prevent a World War II, what they're trying to do is, if not prevent another world war or another you know, massive breakout of conflict like this, at least have some sort of precedent for repercussions. So you're, you know, you're doing this in an effort to set a precedent that if this happens in the future, there will be consequences. The International Military Tribunal for the Far East, or simply called the Tokyo Trial. And with that came the question of who would participate in the trial. Well, it was decided that only the nine countries who signed the surrender of Japan would get to sit in judgment over Japan as well as India and the Philippines, colonies of the UK and USA respectively, who had also been fighting in the war. And so the tribunal would have 11 judges and 11 prosecution teams from each of the 11 countries. They came from Australia, India, Canada, China, France, Netherlands, New Zealand, Philippines, 
Soviet Union, United Kingdom and the United States. So I did a video the other day on all of the places that England has invaded over the years. There is a lot of flags on there that look an awful lot like that, that, that British flag. The defense, however, was compromised of one quarter US lawyers and three quarter Japanese lawyers. Next came the issue of exactly which crimes a person could be indicted for. After all, most of the atrocities weren't committed by the men on trial, but rather by the soldiers. And so it was determined that a person could be indicted for three types of crimes. Crimes against peace, such as planning, preparing or initiating a war. War crimes, such as violating the rules of war like executing prisoners. And crimes against humanity, such as murder, enslavement or deportation. Someone could be tried for any or all of them. However, a person would have to at least be indicted for crimes against peace in order to be tried at the Tokyo trial. Other yeah, so this is the same as what they did with the Nuremberg trial. They basically set it up in a way that if you didn't meet the lowest bar of criteria, then you weren't going to be tried at this specific trial. Now, there were lesser trials where other judgments were passed and everything like that, but they're saying for this specific trial, if you don't meet the, the lowest criteria, then, then you're going to be pushed out. Otherwise, they would be tried at lesser courts. For example, Hiroshi Oshima was the ambassador to Germany. This meant that he couldn't have committed war crimes or crimes against humanity, but he did help in planning a war. Thus he was found guilty, sentenced to life imprisonment, but paroled seven years afterwards. He would die in 1975. Or take the case of Akira Muto. He helped plan several wars and commanded an army in the Philippines where his troops conducted a long list of atrocities. Thus, he was found guilty on all three types of charges and sentenced to death. And then came the question of how long ago an atrocity could have taken place. After all, Japan had been fighting wars since the 19th century. Not only would gathering evidence be difficult, the oldest men on trial were teenagers during the first wars. So it was decided that the leaders could only be indicted for crimes committed after 1931. That's a super interesting part of this to me. Like I said, there really isn't a precedent or groundwork laid. Everything is coming from scratch. So you have to figure even stuff like that, which I would have not really considered. It has to be taken into account because you're going to have different people there that are guilty of different things at different times, especially for Japan, which has been so embroiled in conflict for a long time up to this point. For example, Koki Hirota served as foreign minister and prime minister before the Second World War, but he was still indicted for crimes committed before his retirement. Hence, he was still found guilty of crimes against peace and for waging war against China in the 1930s, and he was sentenced to death. In total, 28 men were indicted, 18 senior military leaders, nine senior political leaders, and one scholar. But none of them were from the imperial family. The USA determined that having the emperor on the throne would make occupying and reforming Japan a lot easier. So even though the emperor and his family were co-conspirators in almost all indictments, the USA decided against prosecuting the imperial family. And not even the defendants would put any blame on the imperial family as they didn't want to portray the emperor in a negative light. If they did comment on the emperor, then there would only be two outcomes. Either they would admit that the emperor was involved, or they would admit that they acted without the emperor's knowledge and thus committed high treason. And so, both the prosecution and the defense avoided the issue altogether. But they weren't the only ones who escaped indictment. The leader of Japan's Human Experimentation Unit also wasn't put on trial. They performed lethal experiments to test the limits of the human body, with methods too gruesome to mention in this video. The USA wanted the research results, and so traded the results in exchange for immunity of all members of the unit. I left a link in the description with the Wikipedia article for more information. But be warned. 
sounds like a Joseph Mengele type thing there. This is one of the things that kind of rubs me the wrong way about the post-war period is the things that the Allies and specifically the U.S. Maybe I just know more about the U.S.'s side of this. Maybe it's because I'm from here. But the things that were done essentially for the quote unquote like greater good of technological advancement um, things like operation paperclip things like this is just i don't know that stuff bothers me bond the testimonies are quite gruesome and other websites do have images of the victims which you probably wish you had never seen the arrest of the 28 men who were indicted didn't happen smoothly though Hideki Tojo attempted to commit suicide by shooting himself in the heart. He was Prime Minister from 1941 to 1944, presiding over most conquests of the Western colonies in Asia, as well as various massacres. He believed that the war was justified, and did not want to submit himself to a foreign tribunal whom they had just fought a war against. Hideki Tojo, however, missed his heart and was resuscitated shortly afterwards. From then on, any arrest would be accompanied by medical professionals, so no war criminal could escape justice by hiding in death. Hideki Tojo accepted full responsibility in order to protect the emperor, was found guilty, and sentenced to death. The judges had assembled. The defendants were gathered, and the lawyers were ready. The trial would take two and a half years during which two defendants died of natural causes in 1946. They were Yasuke Matsuoka, a diplomat who was one of the architects of the Tripartite Pact, and Admiral Osami Nagano, who oversaw the entire Japanese Imperial Navy. Another defendant was deemed mentally ill and unfit for trial, Shumei Okawa, a scholar who was put on trial for his influence over Japan's propaganda program. He acted oddly in court, such as wearing his pajamas or slapping a fellow defendant on the head. He was released from a mental hospital in 1948, spent his later years translating the Quran into Japanese before passing away in 1957. Whether he faked his perfectly timed mental illness remains unknown. Yeah, what do you guys think about that? That seems, that seems odd to me. You know, there's a uh, a famous mob boss who was known for this. God, I can't think of his name off the top of my head. But he basically, when he would have a meeting with another mob associate, he would meet on the side of this street in his pajamas, hair all crazy, not shaven. And he would like walk up and down this street. And literally the whole thing was he was nuts, Right. And so people kind of just assumed he was crazy, even though he was a mob boss and the whole thing was like a charade. And so I'm curious here whether this is legit or not. He spent the rest of his life translating the Quran. I feel like you've got to have at least some like of your, your mental awareness there in order to do something like that, but maybe not. Maybe maybe he was off his rocker, I don't know. What do you guys think? The trial started with the prosecution presenting its case, spending over six months to present all the evidence against the defendants. Their job wasn't easy. As soon as the war ended, Japan's government ordered all troops to destroy any evidence of atrocities. As a result, the prosecution couldn't rely on direct orders of atrocities. So instead, they built their case around the idea that the atrocities were consistent, widespread, and strikingly similar. By proving this, the prosecution wanted to show that such acts could have only been committed if the Japanese government had ordered these massacres. After all, if atrocities were common and similar, then there would need to be some sort of central authority directing these similar acts. But even if that were true, that still wouldn't prove that these men on trial were personally responsible. Theoretically, it was possible that only a few of them directed atrocities while the rest were innocent. So the prosecution tried to prove three things for each of the defendant. 1. 
that the defendants were aware of the atrocities. 2. That the defendants had the power to stop these atrocities. And 3. That the defendants did nothing to prevent these atrocities. And of course, there was almost no evidence that these men ordered any atrocities. But the prosecution was able to prove to the court that almost all defendants did nothing to prevent the atrocities while having the power to do so. Meaning that they were negligent in their duties to uphold the rules of war as laid out in various treaties before the Second World War. This is sort of a weird juxtaposition here. Because the emperor, at least in theory, controls everything. And so you can't bring up the emperor because nobody wants to put blame on him. But they're trying to say that each of these people had the power to to stop these things when if the orders came from the emperor, they they did it. And so that's sort of a weird this would be a hard case to prove, honestly, with the with the Nuremberg trial, you know, the right just they kept meticulous records. They found a ton of paperwork even at the end of the war. They had all of this different evidence, you know, they had video recordings, terrible, terrible recordings from, you know, liberations of, of camps and stuff like that. This seems like a, a little harder of a case to prove going into it. The defense lawyers, however, fought adamantly for their clients, with one lawyer being quoted as saying, I intend to hang 27 of the accused to save my client. Wow. They argued that the court wasn't impartial enough, with the Philippine judge being a victim of Japanese brutality who couldn't be impartial in his verdict, according to the defense. Their request to replace the judge, however, was denied. But they went further, arguing that the trial... That's, you know, the whole thing with the Nuremberg trial was it has to be legit. This has to be a legitimate trial with legitimate judges and a legitimate verdict. Because if not, then this is victor's justice, right? Which a lot of people thought it was that anyway. But certainly they did not want to give the idea any more credit than it already had. Having a judge sitting on the bench that was a victim of Japanese atrocities certainly seems like a conflict of interest there. But uh, that's just my opinion. What, what do you guys think? Trial as a whole did not hold any legitimacy, stating that even if the defendants were negligent in their duty, that they couldn't legally be held accountable. They pointed out that many of the countries on the tribunal, such as France, the Netherlands, the UK and the USA, were only on the tribunal because they colonized Asia, and they colonized Asia through aggressive wars of their own. The defense therefore argued that Japan's wars were no different than Western wars. So why should Japan be held to a different level of accountability than the rest of the world? The defense also attacked the notion that Japan was fighting wars of aggression. Instead, they explained that for centuries, Europe and the USA had invaded Asia, attacking Japan's neighbors one by one, and that Japan was being threatened by Western imperialism. They explained... Yeah, so... I can understand, certainly this is the defense that I expected to be used here. However, I feel like you could just as easily put, throw back at them something like, I don't know, Nanking... And that would pretty much, you know, rule this this type of argument out. Like, no, the, this isn't a, a, like, pointing fingers to everybody but yourself. These are terrible, terrible atrocities. And they were done on a, on a widespread basis. And so, you know, the, the argument always is, or at least, so for the Nuremberg trial... The argument was, uh, or the response to the defense's argument was, that you couldn't claim that like there wasn't a law preventing this, because you some things are just so terrible that you you know it shouldn't be done. 
and they said with that viewpoint murder wouldn't be wouldn't be illegal because everybody would just say well nobody's ever been convicted of murder before you know from the first person on to the last person and then that you know that would be it it was like just because there isn't a legal precedent for the, this doesn't mean that it can't be done because so some acts are so egregious that you you just you know you absolutely know that what is being done is wrong right and so that's i expected this argument but i mean the argument that that this is the the west is like quote unquote attacking japan by attacking its neighbors japan went ape shit on china like it gets overlooked sometimes what was done in china because it starts before the real outbreak of war in europe and it's kind of happening on the peripheral of of the rest of world war ii but they go absolutely ape shit in china and on the chinese people so this this argument holds relatively little weight to me that japan was an isolationist country for 220 years until those powers forced Japan to open its markets to foreign trade. And when Japan was forced to modernize and industrialize to keep up with the invading Western powers, Japan had to invade its neighbors for the resources it needed for its survival. Just as Western powers had done. They argued that the USA cut off oil supplies to Japan as long as Japan was occupying the mainland of Asia. With only two years of oil supplies left, Japan was facing extinction, and so Japan was left with only two choices. Either Japan wasn't going to go to war, in which case Japan would certainly perish, or they would go to war, in which case Japan might perish. If they perished without war, then Japanese culture would perish as other powers would dominate the island nation. But if they perished in war, then its people would rebuild their nation to once more rise to prominence and not that seems like an argument after the fact though why why do you have to be invading mainland asia like the whole thing there is the oil supplies are cut off because you're in mainland asia but you don't have to be in mainland asia and in fact the rest of the world is about to turn on each other and so you could kind of just stay on the sidelines here and figure out what you need to do, you know, from, from that position. Now, I will kind of give credence to the idea that Japan is put into a tough position here by Western powers. It is. But that tough position is really kind of a side note to, to this particular, what was done in this particular circumstance. Like it's, it's, it's kind of on the, on the sideline. It's not really a part of this conversation for this era and what Japan's doing right this second. Although, like I said, I see the viewpoint of them being put in a bad situation. At a time with the USA forcing Japan into these two options, Japan chose to go down fighting. And so the defense argued. The blame of the war did not fall upon Japan, but rather, the blame of Japan's war against Western nations was the fault of the USA forcing Japan to go to war. Therefore, it should not be Japan, but the USA who should be put on trial. There were various versions of this argument made by various defense attorneys, but all of them would follow a similar line of reasoning. But when it came to the atrocities committed during the war, the stories of the men were very different. Some claimed to not have known about them, others claimed that they were justified. For example, Iwane Matsui was commander of the Shanghai Expeditionary Force. <laughs> I think that the captions might have mistranslated there a little bit. I doubt it's he won a Matsui. During the Nanjing Massacre, he defended himself with... It is just the same in a family when an elder brother has taken all he can stand from his ill-behaved younger brother and has to chastise him in order to make him behave properly. Wow. He was found guilty of crimes against humanity and sentenced to death. 
while others testified that they did indeed try to stop massacres and therefore weren't guilty. For example, Mamoru Shimegitsu actively tried to prevent war with the Western powers, but the prosecution argued that he didn't do enough, that he could have stepped down, relinquished power, and choose not to remain part of the system. The court agreed and sentenced him to seven years in prison. He would be paroled after only two years, got back into politics, and served as foreign minister and deputy prime minister before passing away in 1957. After 225 days of the defense presenting their argument, it was time for the judges to determine the innocence or guilt of the 25 remaining defendants. If over half the judges voted a person was guilty, then they would be sentenced. Out of the 55 different charges which could be brought against any of the defendants, the court ruled that 45 of them were either redundant or not authorized by the court, and most of the defendants would be acquitted on several charges brought against them. A total of 7 defendants were sentenced to death. Among those not already mentioned were Kenji Dohaira, chief of the intelligence services in Manchuria and instrumental for planning its invasion and occupation. He turned Manchuria into a vast criminal enterprise where assault, sadism, and a long list of other crimes became commonplace. Seishiro Itagaki, an important figure in the occupation of Manchuria. Haitaro Kimura, commander of the Burma Area Army who played an important role in the invasions of China and Southeast Asia. 18 defendants were sentenced to prison. Among those not already mentioned were Sadao Araki, served in various wars before the Second World War, sentenced to life imprisonment, but was released after seven years due to ill health and passed away in 1966. Kingoro Hashimoto, major instigator of the Second Sino-Japanese War, sentenced to life imprisonment, released seven years later, and died in 1957. Shunroku Hata, Commander-in-Chief of the China and passed away in 1966. Kingoro Hashimoto, major instigator of the Second Sino-Japanese War, sentenced to life imprisonment, released seven years later, and died in 1957. Shunroku Hata, Commander-in-Chief of the China Expeditionary Force, which committed wide-scale atrocities under his command, sentenced to life imprisonment, paroled after six, and died in 1962. Kiichiro Hiranuma, served as Prime Minister and Chief of the Supreme Court of Japan, sentenced to life in prison, paroled after four years, and died shortly after his release. Naoki Hoshino, as Chief Secretary of the government, he was highly involved in Japanese war preparations. He was sentenced to life imprisonment, but paroled ten years later. He would go on to serve as president and chairperson of several companies, before passing away in 1978. Okinori Kaya, finance minister. He prepared Japan's financial, economic and industrial policies for war, sentenced to 20 years in prison and paroled after seven. He rejoined politics and became Minister of Justice after being convicted of war crimes. He died That is wild. in 1977. Koichi Kido, one of the closest advisors to the emperor, sentenced to life imprisonment, released due to ill health five years later, and passed away in 1977, 24 years later. Kuniaki Koisho, governor of Korea, sentenced to life in prison, where he died two years later. Jiro Minami, minister of war, he was sentenced to life imprisonment, paroled six years later, and died in 1955. Takazumi Oka, minister of the navy, given a life sentence but was paroled after six years in prison and passed away in 1954. Kenryo Sato, chief of the Military Affairs Bureau, sentenced to life imprisonment until his parole eight years later. He passed away in 1975. Dang, a lot of these dudes got out way early, and not all for ill health. Shigetaro Shimada, minister of the Navy, sentenced to life imprisonment, paroled after serving seven years, and died in 1976. Toshio Shiratori, ambassador to Italy, found guilty of conspiring to wage war and sentenced to life imprisonment. He died in prison a year later in 1949. Yoshijiro Umesu, chief of the army general staff, sentenced to life imprisonment, 
He also died in prison a year later in 1949. Shigenori Togo, Minister of Foreign Affairs, staunchly against the war with Western powers, he repeatedly advocated for both peace before and during the war. While he informed his superiors of the war crimes he was aware of, the court concluded that he didn't do enough, sentenced to 20 years in prison and passed away two years later in 1950. Teichi Suzuki, primary planner of Japan's wartime economy, sentenced to life in prison. This is tough for me because I feel like there has to be, there has to be some sort of line here between somebody that advocated and tried to get people on like to do the right thing and people who did it and you could say yeah well you know there is a difference and it's how long they're sentenced or whatever but relatively few of the defendants were were sentenced to death and a lot of these people got paroled super early and so it just seems weird to have somebody on there or a couple people on there who they they were totally against this. I don't know. That just, it seems weird that there's not like a clear delineation here versus somebody who was all for it and somebody who was all against it because they didn't like, they didn't do enough. They didn't do enough to stop it. And therefore they're on basically the same level as somebody who was all for it. That's kind of a weird thing to me. Imprisonment, but paroled after serving seven years. He briefly rejoined government service and passed away at the age of 100 in 1989. With him died the last of the Tokyo trial defendants. The seven men sentenced to death would receive their punishment about six weeks later, on December 23, 1948. The seven men were executed by hanging, each dying instantly. No photographs were taken of these men after their executions, with the leader of well, that's a hell of a lot better than the hangings at the Nuremberg trial. ...of the occupation force fearing it would embarrass or antagonize the Japanese people. Instead, four members of the Allied Council would act as official witnesses. Their bodies were cremated, and so ended the Japanese imperial regime. If you liked this video, I also made one on the Nuremberg trial, which you can click on here. And if you want... All right. So that was the Tokyo trial explained by History Scope. Another good video. I liked the Nuremberg trial one too. Um, yeah, really good. As soon as the next episode of the Swedish Ranger series is translated, I will get it out. Whether that's tomorrow, day after, day after that, I'm not sure. I'll have to talk to Light, and I think he's translating this next one and see kind of what his timetable is. But as soon as I get it, I'll put it out. Um, as always, like, comment, subscribe. Help me keep building the channel over here. If you want to join the Discord, I'll put the link in the description box down below. And we can continue these conversations over there. And I'll see you all next time.